Right, members, uh, we now move to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. I call Jim Allister to ask the first question. Mr Allister. Question one. I guess Ida. Uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 1, 2 and 10 together. As the Assembly will be aware, the Union Connectivity Review was launched by the Prime Minister Boris Johnson last year. The Review Chair published his interim report on Wednesday the 10th of March, which touched on a number of issues which will be examined in depth in their final report, due to be completed in the summer. I made my views on the publication of the Review's interim report known earlier this month. At that point, I had read an advance copy of the interim report and met with both the Review Chair, Sir Peter Hendy, and the Secretary of State for Transport, Grant Chaps, to discuss why the promised engagement had not materialised. I have also met with the Secretary of State for Transport and the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on several occasions to discuss the Union Connectivity Review. I will always welcome any proposals to provide much needed investment in transport infrastructure in Northern Ireland, and to that end, I have provided a list of my department's agreed priorities to the review. These reflect the priority transport infrastructure schemes outlined in the New Decade New Approach Agreement, for which funding has not yet been delivered. However, the approach to the review from the British Government is unacceptable. Decisions on devolved matters should be made by local representatives accountable to the people of Northern Ireland, not decided unilaterally in Whitehall. I believe that a fixed link between Scotland and Northern Ireland, whether a bridge or a tunnel, is a vanity project. The enormous costs of construction could be much better spent to improve infrastructure right across the north. We already suffer a substantial infrastructure deficit, especially in the North West. The Executive and the British Government have given many promises to deliver schemes to address this de deficit, not least in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. I do not think a single member here would agree that it would be in the interests of any citizens here to prioritise what appears to be a multi-billion pound bridge or tunnel when we can see that our own transport and water infrastructure networks are crumbling before our eyes with previous funding commitments made by the Prime Minister still not honoured. Mr. Allister, for a supplementary. I have to suggest to the Minister that she let herself down and the people of Northern Ireland by the pejorative, contemptuous, ill considered response that she made before the ink was dry on the interim report. Why would any infrastructure minister, with the commercial interests of Northern Ireland at heart, not want to see radical improvements to the A75, by way of example? I do suggest to the Minister it is time she took off her nationalist blinkers and was something more than a little Irelander. Minister. Thank you, Mr um, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Let us just look at the facts instead of engaging in emotive language. The facts are that I did get an advanced copy of the report I read. It. I entered into the process of the UK Connectivity Review in good faith. My job as the Infrastructure Minister in Northern Ireland is to uh, deliver schemes that will improve the lives of the people of Northern Ireland. This is not a nationalist or unionist issue, and it is lazy to characterise it as that. I am a devolutionist. I believe in power sharing, and I will work across these islands to ensure that we improve our citizens' lives. New Decade, New Approach has a list of infrastructure projects. The Prime Minister has committed to turbocharging infrastructure in Northern Ireland. That is the case that I will continue to make. As for the A75, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is a Scotland transport issue, and I will continue to engage with the Scottish Minister, who has the responsibility and authority on that matter. Call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, why would any infrastructure minister oppose the creation of thousands of jobs, billions of pounds of investment, which would improve the connectivity between our biggest trading partners and ourselves? Is it not the simple case you are opposed to anything that physically connects and strengthens the union? As I have demonstrated since taking up my post, I am committed to working in partnership right across these islands. That is why I have met on numerous occasions with Grant Chaps, with um, my Scottish counterpart and my Welsh counter counterpart, and I will continue to do so. The difficulty that we have here is that our infrastructure is crumbling before our very eyes. Let us look at this Prime Minister's form. He squandered £40 million of taxpayers' money exploring the feasibility of the Garden Bridge in London. 
I could do so much with that £40 million for your constituents, for constituents of every member right across this House, and I make no apologies for continuing to do that. Before I call the next uh, member, I would appreciate if members would keep the remarks to themselves when seated. Uh, there is a process for dealing with these questions to the Minister, and I, I call upon members to respect that, please. Uh, I now call Aram Sir Dolores Kelly. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you're quite right uh, to point out the blinkered vision by some in this House who would believe uh, the promises of Boris Johnson uh, on the delivery of infrastructure, particularly on, on, on bridges. And I'm sure, Minister, you'd agree with me that if people were to be rational and objective and look at what really is going on, is how Northern Ireland is being used and abused by this British government in its appeal to Scottish uh, Conservatives and Labour people in terms of uh, the Assembly elections in Scotland in May? I thank the member um, for her question. And you know, this is typical Tory distraction and deflections from their failings in government. And they have failed in government to honour the financial commitments that they've made to the people of Northern Ireland through new, new decade, new approach. I also agree with the member in her analysis. This is as much about using Northern Ireland uh, in a game, uh, in an electoral game with the SNP uh, that Boris Johnson is obsessed with than with anything else. One thing we know right across this House, regardless of our political position, is that we cannot trust Boris Johnson. Yeah. Boris Johnson does not care about the people of Northern Ireland. He will not put our interests first. I could have thanked the Minister for answers. Minister, one of the essential projects is the A5, and there is a lot of disappointment with the announcement last week about the delays. Why were these issues not raised in the first place at the first inquiry? The issues is about a flood risk and also alternatives. Surely that should have been, this project has been in, on the go now for 15 years, and you can't understand why it has not been raised. I thank the member um, for his question. Um, he will know, as his party colleagues have held the ministerial post responsible for the A5 for five years, that it has been bedecked with legal challenges and difficulties. Uh, the, the public inquiry uh, inspector produced an interim uh, report, which always made it highly likely that we would have to return to a public uh, hearing again. Uh, I reiterate my commitment to this project. I gave very careful consideration to the interim report, sought expert advice, sought legal advice, and I want to. See this project delivered as quickly as possible. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I can understand the Minister's concern that uh, funding for a Boris Bridge or some sort could be better spent through lots of other infrastructure projects, but I fail to understand her approach to the A75 between uh, Gretna, Dumfries and Stranar, which is one of the four projects that have been highlighted as having real potential, uh, given it's the, the failure of the Scottish Government to date to invest significantly in that route. So my question to the Minister is, the Minister was content uh, for uh, the European uh, Union to fund trans-European network links. Now, this is that same road. So what I'm trying to understand is why is she now critical of potentially gaining additional money for the Scottish Government so improved transport links could be put in place for the west of Scotland, for Northern Ireland, and indeed to the benefit of those hauliers from the Republic of Ireland. I thank the member for his question. Um, first of all, we are being told that there is additional money that will be provided. I will reiterate again that the, this government has not honoured the financial commitments that it has already made to the people of Northern Ireland. I am committed to working in partnership. I will continue to do so. But I respect the Scottish Minister for Transport. I respect the devolved settlement there, the same way I respect and uphold the devolved settlement here. I will work with anyone, but when we see what is happening with this government, be it the Internal Market Bill, be it um, the levelling up fund, be it the connectivity review. I have been expressing concerns for some time now about the encroachment of this government into the devolved space, and I do not apologise for standing up for devolution and power sharing here in Northern Ireland. Call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I think the Boris Bridge, or whether it's a tunnel, is a dead cat strategy, and it needs to be seen as that. Can the Minister provide an update on what exact funding the UK Government has supplied uh, under their new decade, new approach commitments for the next financial year? 
Well, much money has been promised, uh, very little has materialised, unfortunately. But I will continue to make the case to the Secretary of State uh, and to all ministers that I can get um, uh, uh, in contact with to ensure that all of the commitments that were made under New Decade approach are honoured. Uh, if we are serious about building back better from COVID together, if we are serious about growing our economy and tackling the climate crisis, then we absolutely must engage in our infrastructure. And so I will continue to make the case and look to colleagues from right across this House to support me in doing so. I call Jonathan Buckley. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister has said that she is in keeping with New Decade New Approach in turbocharging infrastructure and other commitments. But last week, Minister Mallon said that the opening of a UK government office in Northern Ireland was, and I quote, a UK power grab and a clear attempt to undermine devolution. This just happens to be another segment of New Decade New Approach. So could the Minister outline what parts of the agreement does she agree with and which does she not? I thank the member for his question. He refers to, I think it's paragraph seven in New Decade New Approach, which mentions about uh, an office being set up here in Belfast to uh, widen accessibility to London departments. What has transpired is that this government wishes to set the infrastructure priorities for the people of Northern Ireland. It's not about giving us greater accessibility to London departments. It's about London departments being parachuted in with absolutely no accountability to tell the people in Newry, the people in Upper Ban, the people in Lisburn what they need. Call John Stewart. Question number three. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions 3 and 15 uh, together. From the 20th of July 2020, MOT testing resumed for priority vehicle groups, including those vehicles not able to avail of TECs. The DVA has steadily increased its testing, uh, vehicle testing capacity by adopting a range of measures, including the recruitment of additional vehicle examiners, the use of overtime to provide cover for leave and sick cabinets, and a reduction of the vehicle test appointment time. And testing is being carried out at all of the 15 DVA test centres. In light of the ongoing COVID-19 restrictions, I recently announced that existing TECs for qualifying vehicles will be extended by a further four months. This applies to private cars, light goods vehicles and motorcycles aged four to nine years, with TECs which will expire between the 21st of March 2021 and the 25th of March 2022. Four-year-old cars and motorcycles and three-year-old light goods vehicles due a first test between the above dates will also have a four-month TEC applied. New TECs or extensions to existing TECs will be applied automatically to allow vehicles to be taxed. Customers do not need to do anything until they receive a reminder notification from the DVA to present their vehicle for test. In respect of driver testing, the delivery of practical driving tests is currently suspended following the executive's decision to increase COVID-19 lockdown restrictions in December 2020. Resumption of testing will be dependent on the timescale set out by the executive in relation to the easing of these restrictions, which are due for review on the 15th of April. Motorcycle training and testing is unaffected. The DVA has released additional testing slots for May and June. This will provide sufficient booking capacity to allow customers with previously cancelled tests the opportunity to rebook an appointment prior to the booking system opening for other customers. Additional booking slots will also be made available where possible as the DVA increases capacity by recruiting additional examiners. Mr Stewart for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her response. That will come of great interest to those learning to drive, to driving instructors, and to everyone who owns a car that needs an MOT. Um, you'll be aware, Minister, that drivers currently are not receiving their MOT test notice until five weeks before. They're having massive difficulty in actually booking that test. There is huge frustration from many of my constituents, and I'm sure from constituents across the country, that um, they're not able to get that, even though they need the car for, for work or for family commitments or for everything else, and there's just simply not enough slots available. When are you going to be able to increase the amount of capacity that can be carried out so that MOTs can take place in, in an acceptable time frame? I thank the member um, for his question, and we have provided additional capacity in the northwest in Derry by opening up uh, a, second or a second building. Um, in respect of the notification, um, the DVA has recently extended the period MOT reminder letters are issued to customers to six weeks prior to the test due date, and plans are in place to increase this to seven weeks' notice from the 14th of June. 
when the first reminders for vehicles in receipt of the further four-month TEC will be notified to bring those vehicles forward for test. We obviously continue to review the entire process in line with the public health uh, advice and will do what we can to resume services to their full capacity as quickly as we can when it is safe to do so. Keeva Archibald for your question. Keeva Archibald for a question. Um, and I thank the Minister for her um, comprehensive answer. Um, could I ask the Minister also if there has been any consideration on ways to enable essential workers who need a vehicle to carry out their duties to be able to safely access the driving test? I have been contacted by a number of constituents in, in, in that situation. I thank the member for her question. Um, the DVA is actively liaising with the Department of Health to consider the facilitation of priority requests identified by employers from key workers whose jobs are ancillary to medical, health or social care services and who are required to drive for the purposes of their work. It will be for the relevant employers to contact the agency directly to identify their staff that fall within this priority group and the DVA will then endeavour to facilitate priority appointments for both theory and practical driving tests were possible. Call Michelle McElveen. Are we aware of the challenges which COVID has created for the haulage industry with little to no support? The cessation of testing drivers has had a further impact as HGV drivers retire. There is no new pool of drivers to replace them. Can I ask the Minister if she will look at prioritising this important sector? Thank the member um, for her question. Um, my department is in regular contact with representatives of the haulage uh, industry, uh, and what I will ask my uh, officials in DBA too is to make contact with those representatives uh, to identify what difficulty, difficulties there are and what we might be able to do working together to try to resolve them. I call Stuart Dixon. Um, Deputy Speaker, Minister, I appreciate all the difficulties that MOT has in respect of COVID, but you have another difficulty in MOT centres, and that's around the issue of ramps. Can you tell the House what progress has been made in respect of that, and are they all now operational? I thank the member um, for his question. Um, and taking up the post when, when that situation developed, um, I thought that was an extremely stressful situation and then COVID hit. But I'm pleased to say that we have carried out a significant amount of work and all of the lifts that were required for replacement have been replaced and are operational right across the 15 test centres. Here, Mayor Pat Catney, for when you cast, I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, what information have you received from the Executive Office on the recommencing of driving instruction? I thank the member for his question. Um, the member will be aware that the Executive stopped driving instruction in line with the medical and health advice, and my department responded accordingly. Recently, in the roadmap to recovery, the Executive Office deemed that driving tests should be placed in phase two. In order to ensure that my department is prepared, my officials are engaging across departments, including with the Department of Health, to ensure the correct assessment is completed ahead of further reconsideration of any easements. I can assure the member that as soon as it is safe uh, to resume driving tests, my department will be ready to do so. I call Paul Given. Question number four. There has been historical underinvestment in our road network for a significant number of years. Recognising this during the current year, I submitted bids for additional funding for investment in the road network of £11 million and £6.5 million in the June and October. October monitoring rounds. I was very disappointed to receive no funding against my £11 million bid in June and that only £2 million was allocated against my bid for £6.5 million in October. But from the £2 million that I was able to secure, I allocated £1.1 million as a priority to structural maintenance with a balance allocated to street lighting repairs and minor works. In addition, I internally reallocated departmental capital funding of £4.5 million to structural maintenance in January monitoring to utilise remaining available capacity to deliver additional work on the road network over the remainder of the current financial year. Mr Given, for a supplementary. Thank you. Well, I'm deeply disappointed that you didn't get your full allocation, given the underspend from the Minister for Finance and then the way that was then having to be put out the door at the last minute before the end of this financial year. So not good enough on the part of Sinn Féin, and I support the Minister in her bids. Having said that, when it comes to the allocation of public funding, my constituency in Lagan Valley often has funded key infrastructure projects like the North Feeder Road, uh, developments around Prince William, Ballymacash Road, through private sector funding. 
When will my constituency get equality of treatment so that key infrastructure is funded by the public sector rather than pushing up the housing market costs and pricing young people out of the market in what is a difficult area to get housing? And funding the Knockmore Spruceway Link Road would be a good test of this minister to announce 100 per cent funding for it today. I thank the member um, for his question, and he will be aware of the years of underinvestment in our infrastructure, which has led to huge difficulties in terms of the surfaces of current road, and also hugely limits uh, our ability to do much more uh, in respect of new projects. Um, the member may wish to know that I have included a requirement of £120 million um, for capital structural maintenance for the next budget uh, period, um, and I hope that the Finance Minister shares our concerns and that he recommends that this bid for our roads uh, is met. I will continue to make the case around the executive table for greater funding in our infrastructure so that we can improve the quality of life of your constituents uh, and all of our constituents. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mayor Martina Anderson, for you cash, I call Martina Anderson. Me um, I note that the managing rounds agreed by all the executive uh, ministers, uh, so that's something that should be taken back there. But I also note that the Minister, you received £280 million, the biggest ever capital funding ever for your department. So can I ask the Minister, have you ever bid during any of the monitoring rounds to upgrade, to kickstart even the upgrade of the A2 Bunkrana Road? The member will be aware from previous question times of my commitment to the Bunkrana Road. But we have to ensure that due process takes place. Increasingly, Mr Deputy Speaker, I hear calls of just get it done, uh, implying that you know, I should be cutting corners in some way by not following through a uh, proper design process, proper consultation with local communities, uh, and right through every, every stage of the process to ensure that we can get these projects um, delivered in the right way. Um, and so I will continue to take that approach. In respect of um, funding allocations, Mr Deputy Speaker, you, you'll be aware that there is a requirement of around £140 million per annum independently verified by the Barton Report to maintain our road network as is. So I will continue to make the case uh, around the executive table for funding. Uh, and as I said in response to your previous question, I look to all colleagues across this House to be supporting me in that effort. Mayor Daniel McCrossan for UK. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answers to the question so far. I'll just make a very blunt point. The budget for this department for roads was £57 million in 2011, now £27 million. People can read into that as they wish. Minister, I'd like to thank you for, uh, I suppose, putting the hypocrites and Sinn Féin in their box on the A5, Minister, because the reality is the delays to this project, five years by two Sinn Féin ministers and a three-year delay of these institutions being down. Uh, thank you, Minister, for, for, for putting them in their box and making it very clear that the delays are as firmly a member, in their a question. Partner. And also, Minister, can I, can, I, can I ask you to reaffirm your commitment to this project? Thank the member um, for his question. Um, I understand completely the, the frustration locally at the delay in this project. Um, it, it's been around from 2007, and the people of West Tyrone and the wider region, uh, you know, want to see this project um, delivered. So I reiterate again my commitment to doing so. I carefully considered the interim uh, report from the inspector. I took expert advice. I took Crown Council uh, advice, and I believe that in taking the steps that I have, uh, we can prove progress this project um, in the quickest possible opportunity. So I remain committed and I fully understand the frustrations locally uh, among members of the public and elected representatives as well. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number five to the Minister. The sewage requirements for the vast majority of rural properties around Dundonald Village are served by private septic tanks, and such properties are offered an annual septic tank emptying service funded by my department. In terms of further plans for the Dundonald area, I recently consulted on Living with Water in Belfast, the Strategic Drainage Infrastructure Plan for the Greater Belfast Area, which includes Dundonald. The public consultation closed on the 29th of January, and officials are currently reviewing the responses. Living with Water in Belfast identifies the existing strategic drainage and wastewater issues and pressures across the Greater Belfast area in terms of flooding, pollution and development constraints and proposes an integrated and collaborative £1.4 billion plan to address these over the next 12 years. This plan includes a number of opportunities to deliver projects in the Dundonald area, including upper catchment management to store uh, and catch surface water runoff in the Craigantlet and Castlereagh Hills, 
river floodplain restoration works along the Enla River and various tributaries, and sewage improvements to provide increased capacity, combined sewer overflow screening and sewage storage tanks to reduce the risk of out-of-sewer flooding and spills from the network. In terms of the provision of drinking water supplies, Northern Ireland Water prioritises treated drinking water infrastructure to ensure that every household, business, hospital and school has a reliable supply of safe, clean water. Northern Ireland Water reports no specific issues with the supply of drinking water to the Dundonald area. Uh, progression of any water and sewage improvement opportunities is subject to necessary approvals being secured and the funding being made available. However, as the Living with Water programme has been identified as an executive priority in New Decade and New Approach, I will continue to make a strong case for this investment to be made available. I recently wrote to executive colleagues again to advise of the serious pressures facing our water and sewage network and the need for critical investment. Mr Newton, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her very detailed answer. Is the Minister taking into account the fact that uh, Lisburn City Council, Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council, is about to invest somewhere in the region of £36 million in the Dundonald International Ice Bowl, that that investment is likely to leverage another £100 million of investment in the sur area surrounding uh, the Ice Bowl, that that indeed requires to be successful, uh, new roads infrastructure heading towards it, and indeed that there, is, uh, there are proposals for additional housing in the immediate area of Dundonald, and indeed the demand for additional public sector housing within the Dundonald area. I thank the member for his question. Um, we, the reality is that because we have had historic underinvestment in our water and wastewater infrastructure, we are now sitting with some 116 locations across Northern Ireland that are either at or beyond their developmental capacity. And that has consequences. It has consequences in terms of building the many homes that we need that the member has rightly identified. It has consequences in terms of building uh, recreational facilities, hotels, hospitals uh, and schools. Uh, and the utility regulator ha has identified some £2 billion of capital investment that's required in the next price control period. Uh, alone. So, you know, I'm very clear with executive colleagues this is a huge issue, this is a very challenging issue, and if we don't see this critical investment realised, then we won't be able to deliver uh, on our outcomes in the programme for government, and we won't be able to see the development and economic growth uh, in Lisburn and Castlereagh Borough Council, or any of the councils for that matter. Going to be all good, Minister. As you know, there's a lack of capacity in Derry, and there's 3,000 homes in Skeg uh, needing sewage capacity, and they're being delayed as a consequence of it. Can you tell me what um, plans you have in place to accelerate? As you know, no drains, no cranes, no cranes, no drains. Uh, some would say whatever uh, that that's all about, but we need, we know what it's about in the infrastructure committee, and we're very aware of the need for wastewater sewage capacity uh, in Derry. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, Northern Ireland Water has advised that it completed an analysis of its wastewater investment plans for the FOIL constituency at the end of last year. Uh, this investment will require the executive to provide capital funding of approximately £29 million. The planned improvements will target capacity issues in the Colmore Wastewater Treatment Works Network, including a £12 million investment in the upgrade of the Strathfoyle, um, as well as nearly £5 million investment in the Colmore Wastewater treatment works itself. In terms of servicing new growth, approximately £9 million is associated with the new sewage infrastructure investment for the school lands along the A2 Brunkrana Road that Northern Ireland Water is seeking to align with the DFI Road's A2 upgrade scheme. Time for a very quick question from Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, the, the Minister uh, reports the utility regulator has identified the need for £2 billion of investment. Uh, what is the Minister asking for from the Executive? The executive is simple, but I know that it's a tall order. We absolutely have to provide the funding that is required to ensure that we have access to clean drinking water, that we are able to uh, meet our environmental requirements uh, as well, and also that we can, as I say, build the many homes that we need and we can grow our economy. So I will continue to make the case to ensure that we can get the required investment across the line. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call John Blair.
Deputy Speaker, and I hope that the Minister doesn't, may, doesn't mind me returning to, to a previous theme and asking, can the Minister provide an update on active travel plans and how grants to improve cycling and walking routes are being rolled out and utilised? Um, I thank the member for his question, uh, and I know that this is an area he has a keen interest in. Uh, the member will be aware of the investment that my department has provided in the development of greenways uh, and park and rides right across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, we am part of the £20 million Blue Green Fund. Uh, we have also been writing out to the councils and asking them to identify with local communities the opportunities in their council area to enhance active travel, uh, infrastructure and opportunities. Um, I remain committed to this agenda. And while it's not possible at this stage, because we haven't had final allocations of budget to determine what the funding may be uh, next year, I give a commitment uh, to the member that I will continue to do what I can to maximise active travel opportunities uh, for constituents right across Northern Ireland. Supplementary question for Mr Blair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, to thank the Minister for that answer. And, uh, and following up on that, can I ask how the routes will be identified and if there will be a proportionate concentration of routes um, outside metropolitan and urban areas as there will be inside those areas so we can reduce commuter traffic and therefore also pollution? I thank the, the member for his supplementary question. Uh, I'm very keen to ensure that we do not leave our, our rural communities uh, behind when it comes to the active travel agenda. Uh, I've also been very clear that I don't believe in delivering government uh, from top down uh, and imposing what I believe to be the, the right approaches for local active travel routes on communities. That's why we've been working very closely uh, with the councils through my uh, walking and cycling uh, champion. Um, that's why we have the uh, community safety grant as well for local communities. So I very much want to continue to work in partnership with councils and with local communities to identify the right opportunities for active travel so that when we bring about change we do so in a lasting and sustainable way. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, can you give me an update on the plans for pedestrianisation and active travel in Derry City Centre, please? I thank the member for her question. Um, a pop-up cycleway was delivered in June 2020 between the Harbour Square roundabout and the council offices through the riverfront car parks. My department continues to work with the Council and other stakeholders to identify measures for social distancing within Derry City Centre. Officials are developing draft proposals in the Ferry Quay Street, Diamond and Bishop Street areas. These measures may include repurposing road space to improve social distancing where footways are narrow, introduction of a one-way street or removal of on-street parking to enhance provision for walking and cycling or the introduction of parklets. My department is also progressing several walking and cycling measures in collaboration with the Council. The more significant of these include the North West Greenway proposals for both Derry and Straban. There are other walking and cycling measures proposed at Strathfoyle in the Maydown area and along the Limavady Road from Ebrington. I am also providing funding for the construction of the Strathfoyle Greenway and the Straban North Greenway. Minister, in line with the COVID recovery plan and indeed in particular the High Street recovery plan, it is really particularly important that businesses can use the outside space, but also that they share that space with our citizens, uh, etc. Will you commit and guarantee that you will do everything that you can? We have uh, the tourism season, um, COVID. Uh, ready um, uh, during the summer, and we're hoping that our tourism sector can use that outside space. But we do need your support, Minister. I, I, I thank the member um, for her question, and uh, I think um, as a result of, of COVID, but I think this was a, an agenda that was really important even before COVID. We need to be better at reimagining our space. Uh, I think a people-centred approach to place shaping is the right one, uh, and I think we all must work together to ensure that we are reimagining our space so that people can, when it is safe to do so, come together in a safe way uh, to be able to you know, shop in our local businesses. Uh, we will very much be reliant on Indigenous tourism going forward, uh, and so I give a commitment that I will continue to work with stakeholders right across uh, the North to ensure that we are reimagining our spaces together and we're doing what we can to support our businesses in particular during this difficult time. I call Pat Sheehan for a question. Corla, uh, could I ask the Minister to give an update on the Casement Park development? I 
I thank the member for his question. I announced my decision to recommend planning approval for the new stadium at Casement Park on the 13th of October. Uh, the final decision will issue when a Section 76 planning agreement with the applicant and relevant parties has been satisfactorily concluded and work on this is ongoing at PACE. This planning application remains a priority for my department. The drafting of a planning agreement is a complex legal matter, and as a supporter of this project, I'm sure the member will agree with me, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the need for it to be done right. The Departmental Solicitor's Office and the GAA's legal team remain in regular contact in respect of the details of the planning agreement, and both parties are keen to reach agreement as soon as possible. I look forward to the final planning decision issuing for this project, as I am of the view that the project will give a real boost to sport across our island, the local economy in West Belfast, and it will finally give the GAA its home in Ulster. It has been five months since the Minister made her announcement uh, to approve plans for Casement Park. Uh, and in the meantime, there appears to have been no progress whatsoever. I am wondering, uh, given the fact that Antrim and Ulster Gales are getting very frustrated about not having a state-of-the-art modern uh, stadium, and that uh, Casement Park, like the A5, is one of the executive's flagship projects, can the Minister give an assurance that there will not be a similar failure to deliver as there has been in the case of the A5? I thank the member for his question. To state that there is no progress is factually incorrect. Uh, there have been a number of draft agreements shared between uh, my department and the GAA's solicitor. Uh, the drafting of a planning agreement is a complex matter. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am not suggesting for one moment that anyone wants me to cut corners and to put the project in jeopardy. So I will continue to do what I can, and my officials will continue to work at a pace on this very important project. But I do share the view that if we had have had an assembly and an executive uh, for the three years that it was down, then we would have made much more progress on this really important project. I call Karen Mullen for a question. Uh, Minister, I have wrote to you over the road safety uh, at the junction of Northland Road and Rock Road at McGee University. Um, there have been several serious collisions. Unfortunately, l last year a young man lost his life. I urge you to undertake a review of the location with a view to introducing additional protection for road and pedestrians in that area. I thank the member for raising this very important issue. And what I will commit to do is um, discussing the matter with my officials and ask them to provide you with an update on what actions we can take um, and make sure that that gets to you at the earliest opportunity. Thank the Minister for her answer. And following on from a colleague from FOIL, um, a good outcome from COVID has been more people are active and out and about and enjoying our outdoors. Um, I'm just asking any, uh, for an update on any investment your department will make in our walkway and green spaces to light them up and make them more user friendly. I'm thinking of my own city of the FOIL Road and Bay Road area. I thank the member for her question. And, um, she, she raises a very, very important point, and it's particularly important um, when we reflect on uh, the tragic uh, deaths of uh, the two women uh, at, the, at the weekend, um, on the importance of women feeling safe. Uh, and what I want to do as the Minister for Infrastructure is ensure that we are making women feel safe. And for me, an important part of that is street lighting. Uh, the member will be aware that I allocated a budget to ensure that we could have a full 12 month repair of our street lighting. Uh, but I'd be very keen to work with councils uh, and with others to see what more we can do to ensure that, yes, we're lighting them up to make our spaces attractive, but also, importantly, that we're lighting them up so that women and young girls and everyone who wants to go out walking can do so and feel safe. I call Mark Durkin for a question. Uh, for the past few weeks, contractors have been busy at work in the Strathfoyle and Maydown area of Derry where I live. Can the Minister update us on the work going on in this long neglected area? I thank the member for his question. Um, the Strathfoyle to Maydown shared use path will be a continuation and extension of the Council's Strathfoyle Greenway and Waterside Greenway projects, which provide a shared footway cycleway from the Peace Bridge to Stranddown Drive in Strathfoyle. 
Phase 1 of the Strathboyle Shared Use Path will provide new three-metre-wide off-road facilities for both walking and cycling on the Temple Road at Clumbing Drive and Haw Road. Phase 1 started in the autumn of 2020 and is substantially complete. Phase 2 of the project involves upgrading and widening the existing substandard footway on the Maydown Road from the Haw Road Junction to the police station to the desirable standards of a shared use path. The proposed alignment and location of the shared use path ensures there is no carriageway crossing movements required for walking and cycling, creating a safer road environment for all road users. Phase two is underway, and I'm pleased to say it is expected that it will be complete by the summer. It is expected that a resurfacing scheme will be undertaken alongside this project too. Mark Durkin, supplementary question for Mark Durkin. Thank you, and I thank the minister for her answer and indeed for her investment in the Strathwell and Maydown area. With the progress on the Strathwell Greenway, along with that of this uh, shared use path between Strathwell and Maydown, does the Minister and do her officials see merit in the ultimate continuation of the Greenway out as far as the village of Eglinton? I thank the member for uh, his supplementary question. and The member will be aware that I am very much committed to Greenways. Uh, they deliver huge benefits uh, to people in terms of better mental well-being, uh, better physical health, uh, promoting active travel. And it's also really good for the environment as well and people reconnecting with nature, which is one of the, the chinks of light throughout uh, the COVID crisis. So I will continue to do what I can to maximise uh, our opportunities for citizens right across Northern Ireland to avail of greenways and to do as much as we can to ensure that we do have continuous uh, routes for greenways, not just here in Northern Ireland, but right across our island, because I believe that there's huge potential which remains untapped to do so much more in this very important area. I call Andrew Muir. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister will be aware of the rather disappointing resource draft budget settlement for the next financial year, but it is up for the Minister to decide how to cut that cake when she is given that. Will the Minister give a commitment to rebalance her investment towards active travel in the context of a recent question I got back where there is 1,400 staff employed by DFI Roads but only 33 and a half employed in Transport Policy Division. I thank the member for his question, and the member will know that I created the new blue-green uh, infrastructure fund of £20 million. Um, I remain committed to this agenda. We have also been engaging in recruitment to ensure that we have more people uh, in the department working on the roadside that are aware of the opportunities for active travel, and so that we are having that design at the very beginning of processes. Um, so I will continue to do what I can, but you are right. Um, the draft budget allocation as it stands is deeply concerning uh, and it will have ramifications. I know members are very concerned about the surface of roads, members are very concerned about street lighting, members are very concerned about active travel, but unless I'm given the budget to be able to do these things, then difficult decisions lie ahead with consequences for all of our constituents. A very brief question, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister uh, referred to a lot of capital spending, and I do welcome that, but very little resource has been put towards active travel. There are schemes in my constituency we would like delivered, such as an active travel hub or the One Path initiative. Will the Minister give a commitment to put funding into resource initiatives for active travel? I thank the member um, for his question, and you will be aware of the huge pressures on the resource side of my budget, um, right back from when there was the smash and grab uh, when Danny Kennedy was the minister. So I give a commitment that I will, but I cannot give a commitment on numbers because the final budget allocation has yet to be determined. Thank you, members. Uh, time is up. If you take it, point of order. Yep. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is it in order for a member to address a minister, or another member for that matter, as a little Irelander? Uh, the remark made by Mr Alistair towards or about Minister Mallon isn't just inappropriate, it's insulting and it's inflammatory. Uh, the member should apologise, withdraw it and wise up. I think that would be a matter for the Speaker to rule on. I myself would determine it to be rather juvenile and inappropriate behaviour. But uh, I'll relay that back to the Speaker for him to make a determination on it. Yeah. Mr Buckley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could you clarify, is it in order for members to speak in Irish and not provide self-translation? The appropriate practice would be that if anyone speaks in Irish, that they 
re return and provide the appropriate words in English for those who don't understand that, that language. That would be the appropriate uh, practice in the Assembly.